you think about the kind of events that are going on around the world, corporate media tends to turn it on its head with the real news that was sort of interesting. It's actually turned things back on its feet so that you can actually understand the reason for certain types of events. Thanks for joining us again. In the studio, I have with me Jim Stanford from the Canadian Auto Workers. And on Skype, we have Justin Fox from Time Magazine. The two gentlemen are here to talk about the proposed bailout for the auto industry. And uh, so far, we have discussed what the uh, dire situation is for the auto industry, the, the proposal to perhaps uh, declare bankruptcy that Justin has proposed, um, what the ramifications of that are. What I'd like to talk about is the possibility of some public control, some public funding uh, or public shareholding situation for the auto industry, something that in North America certainly I, uh, hasn't taken place before. So perhaps I don't know how you uh, would like to respond to this, Jim, whether there's any proposal on the table for some public control over the auto industry, even in Canada, um, and then Justin, if you could respond to that. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Geraldine, this would be a good time to nationalize it if you wanted to, because you can sure it's pick cheap. them up for cheap. <laughs> uh, clearly, if uh, government is going to participate in restructuring the industry and trying to move it forward, uh, they're going to demand a quid pro quo. They're going to want to see the value for what they put in, and that can come in various forms. Already, under the energy bill, where the $25 billion in the U.S. has been approved, that is conditional on that money being invested in American facilities uh, and to create American jobs. And frankly, I think that's quite uh, legitimate. Our perspective in Canada has been that the Canadian governments, both the federal government and the government of Ontario, should be there on a proportional basis doing its bit in order to get a proportional share of the investment in jobs at the end of the day. Because for GM and Ford and Chrysler, they've been operating continentally for 40 years. It doesn't make sense to kind of take a big knife and try and cut off the Canadian plants, which are some of their most efficient plants. So you might as well try to solve the problem on a continental basis. Now, the question I think you're getting at is how do you guarantee the public interest in that? And part mm -hmm. of that has to be that you're going to ensure a viable plan going forward, that you're not just throwing money at these companies and then they're going to declare bankruptcy in six months anyway. Secondly, that they're not going to take the money and, and run in the sense of putting them into operations in other countries. And there's various ways you could do that. You could tie it to uh, particular investments. You could tie it to particular product or job targets. Um, one thing they did in the 1979 restructuring with Chrysler was they gave the government an option to buy shares. It was a share option that if the company returned to profitability, they could buy the shares and either hold them to keep an equity investment or what they ended up doing, which was just exercising the options and making money off of the fact that Chrysler could now succeed and so the options had value. So both the US and Canadian governments that assisted Chrysler in 79 made hundreds of millions of dollars of profit off of that exercise. Or you could also see government staying on as a permanent shareholder. Volkswagen which, uh, Justin, I think was the world's most valuable traded corporation uh, uh, for a couple of days two weeks ago, has a significant public ownership share from the state government in, uh, in Germany, and uh, it's done very well. So I think all of those options are on the table. Uh, clearly, the government has to uh, make sure the public interest is protected, and more importantly, make sure there's a viable plan, because I, I am not in favor of a bailout if a bailout just means throwing at, uh, money at the problem and hoping that that solves it, because it won't. And finding ourselves perhaps in the same position exactly. six months from now. Justin, what about you? How do you respond to uh, the idea of some government uh, ongoing government to control? The legislation that's in front of Congress right now, there are some strings tied to it, but not very serious. So they just didn't have time to really plan out anything like Jim was just talking about. I mean, the Chrysler deal in 79 was in a way a sort of bankruptcy light. I mean, creditors had to give, um, workers had to give some, and shareholders, I guess shareholders, well, they'd already given a lot. Um, so it was this way of, of dealing with some of the things you deal with in Chapter 11, reduce your debts, reduce without actually, I'll finish his sentence, without actually going into bankruptcy protection. What's going on in the, in the U.S. right now and in financial markets globally is dramatic enough and severe enough that I, I, I think there is some case for structuring some sort of rescue plan. I, I, I do think that with, with what's been talked about on Capitol Hill this week, all they're really talking about is try to get them some money to get them through till January 20th when we have a new administration that's more in the mood to sort of figure out something long term and isn't about to leave office. Right, but 
so the idea of some level of public control to you is... Uh... I mean, I, I'm uncomfortable with it for really long term, but I, I got to say a lot of these things Jim's saying, you know, 10 years ago I would have said that's crazy, we're doing great in North America with without any sort of support for our auto industry and we have all these great new industries coming up. And, and there is an issue with all these countries around the world supporting the auto industry. That's one of the reasons we have a certain amount of global overcapacity in the auto industry. Um, but I, I mean, this, this, this is a different age, and and I and I do think there's there's some arguments to be made. I mean, in the U.S., we have we we go to great lengths to protect our sugar growers, which is absurd, and we do nothing for our automakers. So I don't know. Um, I, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of long-term ownership, and I and I just have this feeling we'd mess it up if we tried it. But some shorter term, helping them reorganize, sort of figuring, and and I guess to me the biggest thing is figuring out a way to help in the U.S. to help them deal with these retirement and, and retiree health care commitments that, that they've made. Because they made them after World War II. This was public policy in the U.S. to encourage big companies to take on these really big commitments. And no one thought then that GM, which was then you know, the greatest, most dominant company on earth, would ever not be the greatest, most dominant company on earth. And, and so it was planned pretty poorly. I think there are other, you know, other countries have also messed up retirement planning in big ways by not setting aside any money for it at all. What we do is we sort of shove them, we, we, we use it very inconsistently. I, I got to think and I would hope that one of the big things Congress in the U.S. will be talking about over the next four years is both some, some way to get health care so it's not so completely tied to the employer and second of all, some way to create a supplemental retirement system beyond Social Security that, that's you know funded by people putting money in, but is it something more than the kind of haphazard system we have right now in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. It certainly seems like there's a, a lot of restructuring that can be done right across the board. And I think, uh, obviously, the new president-elect, Obama, will be busy uh, perhaps uh, working forward over the next four years uh, and perhaps longer, who knows. Um, Jim, any final words on this matter? No, I think Justin's uh, final comment there was bang on, frankly. I think uh, you got, we've got to look at other ways of uh, structuring our high-value industries so they are sustainable on an ongoing basis because we can't leave it up to the, the Walmarts and the uh, fast food outlets uh, to provide our jobs in the future. We've got to have high-value, high-productivity jobs to have strong communities, and we've got to find a way to, to fund them on a sustainable way, both environmentally and economically. Yeah, of course, this... This uh, little discussion really has only just touched the surface of uh, all the issues involved and perhaps we can talk again um, perhaps after the bailout if it goes through or if it doesn't go through perhaps we can have another talk about the, the ramifications following that but I do thank you both for your time and thanks to you for watching. At The Real News we will continue to provide you with more information on North America's auto industry as decisions are made. As always, we encourage you to spread the word among friends and colleagues about our programming and, if possible, to donate and keep us growing. This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not going to sleepwalk into more wars and into environmental disaster, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Real hope means facing a complex reality. Your tax-deductible donation makes it possible. Please contribute. Visit therealnews.com.